Tbilisi, Georgia's capital. The mother of Georgia monument towers over the city. In one hand, she holds a bowl of wine to welcome friends. In the other, a sword to fend off enemies. The small country is locked between three large nations, Turkey, Iran, and Russia, with which it has a difficult history. We experienced this uh, friendship and hugs by Russia for 200 years, and thank you, we don't want it anymore. The Russians have left a shadowy world deep underground. Even most locals are unaware of the secret realm that lies hidden just a few meters below them. Three young people are exploring these subterranean spaces and making uncanny discoveries. Oh, this one. It must have been terrible in here. Tbilisi by night. While the world sleeps, Tornika and Anna are on a mission to explore the city's underworld, a hobby known as urban spelunking. We're going down now into one of the largest bunkers here in Georgia. It was the Soviet government's secret command center. Coming down here in the dark is not without its dangers, but they don't want to risk being seen entering. We keep an eye out for each other and always go in pairs. It's important because vandalism and break-ins are common. There's always a risk that we'll come across people in the bunker, potentially dangerous people. The bunker's main entrance has been buried. It's now only accessible by a well-hidden ventilation shaft, running 10 meters deep, then leading further down. At the bottom, everything has been abandoned for decades. We're at a depth of about 20 meters now. It's not more. No, now it'll lead down even further, down to about 80 meters. The bunker is filled with garbage. Cool, the air clammy, it's pitch black without a flashlight. Water has seeped into the bunker. The two explorers have to watch their every step. It's eerie. But that's exactly what Tornika loves. It started seven or eight years ago when my grandparents told me a story about a hidden Soviet treasure. 300 tons of gold were supposedly hidden in a bunker in Tbilisi, so I started looking. Three years in, I realized it was probably just an urban legend. Going underground had fascinated me, though, so I decided to go searching for bunkers. Through Tornika's passion, Anna has caught the bug. At first, it was purely professional interest. I'm an archaeologist, so I thought Tornika's work was great. Two years ago, Tornika took me into a bunker for the first time. It was really interesting. It fascinated me. That's when I realized it was more than just passing interest. I've been an enthusiastic explorer ever since. The Soviet military in Georgia operated from this bunker. This was the main command center in the Soviet era. If a war had ever broken out, the government back then would have come down and could have run the whole country from here. We've got these buttons with all the major Georgian cities marked. Sikumi, Gori, Kutaisi, Batumi, Tbilisi. This place was once top secret. From here, there was a direct link to the Kremlin in Moscow. A lot of it is unfortunately damaged, and it's hard to tell what the other buttons were for, but it's clear that the whole country was run from here. 
135 rooms and two kilometers of tunnel. It's one of the largest military bunkers ever discovered. The Russians only left after the 1991 collapse of the Soviet Union. At the end of the 1980s, it became increasingly difficult for Russia to control Georgia. There were mass protests against Soviet rule. The people demanded independence. Moscow reacted harshly. Most uh, bizarre and tragic day, uh, 9th April of 1989, when uh, peaceful protesters in the central city, Rostov uh, Street, were oppressed and 21 young people died. Many demonstrators were beaten to death with sharpened spades, a favored weapon of the Soviet special forces. I think 1989, and really that April 9th, was when communism came to an end here, when things were so shaken up with the power of the Soviet Union. We can say that from 89, Georgia was on the path to independence. Two years later, in April 1991, the Soviet Union withdrew. After some 70 years, Georgia was independent again, though the joy was short-lived. It's a tragic in Georgian case that uh, there was no room to uh, enjoy this transition and the re-establishing the independent in full scale. Even after Soviet withdrawal, things weren't peaceful in Georgia. The Abkhazia and South Ossetia regions now also demanded independence. While Georgia regarded them as part of the country, war erupted. The 1990s were an extremely difficult time for Georgia. There were several wars between Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And on top of all that, a civil war in Tbilisi. In the turmoil of the Civil War, many documents crucial for today's understanding of the Soviet occupation went missing. The former KGB building in Tbilisi burned down during the Civil War, which of course meant many files were lost. The fire was deliberate, of course. Before it was burned down, the KGB took a sizable chunk of it to Russia, where it was partially destroyed. Only around 20% of the files remain. It's what makes it so difficult to find out where the Soviet Union built underground, where their bunkers are hidden. There are certainly plans. They couldn't have built without them. But they're likely still a military secret. It would be fascinating to really see all of it, because I'm sure what we know about the tunnels and bunkers now is only a fraction of it. Tornika is trying to find out. He spends every spare minute looking for bunkers all over Georgia. On YouTube, he's wise guy. Whenever he discovers something, he makes a video. We started out illegally, as all urban spelunkers do. We climbed into abandoned bunkers, sometimes through ventilation shafts. But we always followed one golden rule, never revealing where the bunker's entrances are. The Georgian government became aware of Tornika and offered him an official assignment, searching for and securing bunkers. He's now the only legal underground urban explorer in Georgia. Now we're officially allowed to hunt for bunkers. Our organization SHIELD cleans up old and abandoned bunkers from the Soviet Union era and logs them. We clean them out, repair the doors and lock them to prevent them from being littered or looted. With all the inherited Soviet concrete and steel, Tornika has his work cut out for him. 
In 1801, Georgia asked Russian Tsar Paul I for protection from its neighbors. Those two large Islamic states, the Ottoman and Persian empires, inflicted great suffering on Georgia. A Christian country was sought as a protective power. But Tsarist Russia became not only a protector, it incorporated Georgia into the empire. Then, for the next 50, 60 years, it was constant uh, trying to forgetting of the Georgian language. The official language was Russian. All the information and news outlets were, were issued in um, Russian. The theater was Russian. It was an attempt to Russify Georgia and suppress Georgian culture. It was also being said that small nations like Georgia had no future. They should be absorbed by the larger national units, meaning Russia and the like. But the people of Georgia resisted the Tsar. The rebels were fueled by the ideas of communism, their main enemy, the Tsar and his feudal system. They were under very strong surveillance of police. Uh, like the police agents were always following them. The Georgian communists set up a secret hideout on the outskirts of Tbilisi. And it was a top secret uh, place, uh, top secret activity. Uh, Tsarist police and the gendarmerie could not identify the location. It's said that he hid here. Yosef Vizarionovich de Yugashvili, later to call himself Stalin, a Georgian by birth and a communist. A printing press was hidden in this house. Stalin expert Jana Odiashvili knows where to find it. This is Stalin's underground printing house. It was established in 1903 and it worked uh, until 1906. This is the place where uh, young communists uh, were printing their newspapers and magazines uh, for the removal of the Tsar. And this place uh, has a secret. The well behind the house isn't just a well. Looking down, you can't see that there is a secret tunnel going this way that le led to a secret uh, room. This secret room lies beneath the house, accessible only via the well. The communists used this well shaft as a hidden entrance to a connecting passage that led back up via a shaft to a room under the house. Getting through the secret passageway must have been just as difficult back then. Really hard job. Well, this is where was the printing house itself, secret printing house. For example, this is a very old printing press. It was made in Germany, in Augsburg, and it's from 1893. In this uh, secret room, they printed the propaganda materials in uh, three different languages, in Georgian, Armenian, and Russian. But in 1906, a raid by the secret police uncovered the hiding place. They were almost done with checking the house, but in the end, one policeman decided to do what I'm doing right now. So they decided to light the paper and drop it and check the depth of the whole well. The paper flew into a secret tunnel, and that's how they realized that there was something going on. Police discovered the printing press beneath the house. Uh, this uh, secret under underground printing house is another way to glorify Stalin uh, and uh, make him a hero. However, there are doubts if he has ever been here uh, in real life. A Soviet-era museum in celebration of comrade Stalin. Here, little has changed since Georgia's independence. The why it's so strongly identified with the name of Stalin is because of the uh, Soviet Russian totalitarianism in 1930. It's a time when they are constructing the cult of the person 
personality of Stalin. Stalin is uh, everything and everywhere. Was he ever here or not? What's undisputed is that Stalin actively fought against the Tsar. By that time, he had already met Lenin, and Lenin constantly complained that there was not enough money for revolutionary purposes. Stalin, of course, wanted himself to be seen as the man who could raise the money. Tbilisi, 1907. 29-year-old Stalin and a group of peers committed one of the country's most spectacular crimes. They robbed a bank stagecoach, transporting money. On that day, uh, Stalin had information that money was uh, transported from the uh, post office uh, to the state bank. He knew precise uh, time, it was 10.30 uh, a.m. in the morning on 26th of June. Stalin's gang stationed a getaway vehicle near the bank. Bolsheviks had uh, lookouts everywhere because, of course, uh, Russian secret police or Khan also knew that there was something big happening. Uh, lookouts gave each other secret signals. Upon one signal, the attack on the stagecoach began. The robbers came from all sides. Then, following another signal, hand grenades and shots. In just three minutes, it's all over. Archives say that uh, about uh, 40 people were killed and 40 others were injured on this uh, day. The robbers made off with almost 250,000 rubles, an equivalent of some 3 million euros today. It was a spectacular bank robbery, of course, in 1907. All over the press, and a hefty sum was stolen. That's what, uh, uh, that was a year's income for the Tsar. That the Russian Tsar received as much money from the state per year as was seized in one day, you can imagine, it was a lot of money. The frantic search for the money was on, with all of Georgia hunting for the robbers. They had taken the spoils out of the country, though, hidden inside mattresses and furniture. Stalin was lauded as a communist hero. At the time, it was seen as a revolutionary act. They called it expropriation. They took the money for the revolution from the bourgeoisie. In 1917, it began. Under Lenin's leadership, the communists seized power in Russia and ended the czarist rule. The Russian Empire disintegrated, initially sinking into chaos. Of course, the revolution created the possibility that the borders of the Russian Empire would fall away. Russia was preoccupied with matters at home. Georgia took advantage of the crisis, declaring its independence in 1918. The country became a democratic republic and guaranteed human rights in its constitution. Minorities were also represented in politics, for example. Diverse groups, including women, were actively involved. First of all, the women's um, elective rights. Uh, it, Georgia was a foreigner country, then uh, many European powers also. Russia first recognized the independence of the Republic of Georgia in 1920. But just one year later, the Red Army invaded. One man played a decisive role in this new conquest, Georgian-born Joseph Stalin. Over time, his strength had risen, until he stood alongside Lenin. I think that this was a personal decision by Stalin and for his prestige to uh, uh, regain uh, Georgia. For Stalin, this was wichtig. For Stalin, it was important because the Bolsheviks had all said that they were internationalists. But probably he didn't want to remain a foreigner in this future Soviet empire. And for him, it was very important to conquer Georgia. Upon his return to his homeland, the population met him with open rejection. In 
June 1921, when uh, uh, Stalin came here, he was uh, blown and he was uh, thrown some eggs during this meeting. So then uh, full-scale repressions started uh, against those people who were against Bolshevik power. A terrifying time began in Georgia. In Kaspi, a small town near Tbilisi, traces of this period of oppression can still be found. This building, now used as a school, once housed a police station. On her own initiative, teacher Nino Niparishvili has set up a memorial here. She shows Anna the cellar. Nino's father discovered it after the Russians left. Here are the so-called single cells. We found three of these cells. Look at this room. You can go inside. It's impossible to lie down. The only thing you can do is sit on the floor or stand. You can scream, you can shout, but no one in the world can hear you. The soundproof room measures one meter by one meter. The oxygen supply could be regulated via pipes from outside. It must have been terrible to be in here. You didn't know how long you were held captive for. I only had to endure a few seconds in here now. And the humidity, the cold, the lack of oxygen, especially for someone with claustrophobia, it must have been hell in here. Mostly it's been left as it was found. What were the chains used for? We don't know exactly what they were for, if they were used to shackle people, but the individual cells are in the next room. One could guess what the chains were for. Were people tortured here? Very likely, yes. There was a chair here that was connected to the power supply with lots of electrical wiring. When a person sat there, wires were connected to the ankles, knees, shoulders, hands and neck. There were a lot of wires. My father first discovered it after the Russians left. He was appalled. The first thing he did was get rid of it. It doesn't exist anymore. No, not anymore. I'm very sorry about that, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they made all evidence of torture like that disappear. It would have been solid proof of what the regime did to people. Nino collects photographs and names of Soviet-era victims. The persecution of objectors began as early as 1924. The newly founded secret police, the Cheka, carried out the first purge and cracked down on dissidents with brutal severity. Lavrin T. Beria, Stalin's right-hand man in Georgia is behind the Great Terror of 1937 and 38, a wave of purges that sweeps across the entire Soviet Union. The Great Terror began across the Soviet Union, in Georgia a little later even, and it raged on brutally. Beria was the personification of that terror in Georgia. Beria rises to the closest circle of power around Stalin. Under him, countless people in Georgia are tormented, tortured, and killed. Several tens of thousands of people were thrown into the dungeons. Almost half of them were killed. 99% of the remaining part were sent to Gulag and the majority of them did not survive because of the uh, incredibly difficult and uh, inhuman environment in the Gulag system, so they starved to the death. Penal camps called Gulags are set up all over the Soviet Union. 
most of them in Siberia. Many Georgians disappeared forever. The few who survived came back severely traumatized. After 1937 and 1938, whole generation remembered that disaster and this fear, trauma, mistrust was defining the future attitudes of the society. At the end of 1938, Moscow ended the Great Terror. Stalin declared it a hard-won victory over the Soviet Union's enemies. The secret police remained active in Georgia, though. This building in Tbilisi is said to have also contained secret torture chambers. Anna investigates rumors of the gruesome things reported to have happened here. I've heard there used to be a police station here, and I think I'll find Soviet-era prison cells inside. Today, it's a residential building. After Russia withdrew in 1991, the cellars became accessible for the first time. One of the house's residents remembers it. There were thick layers of blood on the walls. They tortured people? Yes, they were torture cells. Today, they're cellars. They were cleaned out. But when I was down there the first time, I could see with my own eyes what must have happened there. They hung people up with chains. They hang people? Yes. It's only a few steps down into the cellar. At first glance, Anna sees nothing unusual. Then the rooms that probably served as cells. This appears to be a bunk bed where prisoners slept. The cell was probably meant for two people looking at the bed. I imagine it would be terrible to be locked up in here. Especially when you think of the Soviet era, the oppression and terror. It was even worse for the prisoners then. It's unclear when and for how long people were imprisoned here. No records exist anymore. Some of the rooms are locked now and being used for storage. Then. Anna finds a clue. There's something carved in here. One, nine, five, oh. That must be the year. My guess is that the prisoners were here in that year, 1950. And there are names. Presumably of prisoners, all in Russian. Tengiz, Valiko, Roberti, Linia. I think these must be the people who spend time in the cell, who were incarcerated here. Many questions remain unanswered. This prison in Tbilisi is also linked to Beria. Stalin gave him a new assignment after the war, to build the Soviet Union an atomic bomb. Russia detonated its first atomic bomb in 1949. These pictures are from 1951, the first test in which a bomb was dropped from an airplane. It marked the beginning of the Cold War and the arms race with the U.S. 
With NATO, the West founded a defense alliance, which Turkey, Georgia's neighbor, also joined. In 1959, here in Western Turkey, the US stationed medium-range missiles armed with nuclear warheads. They were within range of Georgia. People here were constantly talking about how many NATO missiles were aimed at Tbilisi. The Soviet Union wanted to be prepared. Nuclear bunkers were built throughout Georgia. Tornika takes us to a special bunker. Technically off limits to the public, the underground explorer is allowed to bring tourists here. Now we're in another secret command bunker. There were several of this kind in Tbilisi. During the Soviet era, they were responsible for controlling certain regions. Back then, people were here around the clock. This is the dormitory where the soldiers slept. Even in the event of a nuclear war, work could still continue here. This is the best protected room in the bunker. It has six hermetic doors, and at the time it was important for the power supply. The bunker has a ventilation system, communication facilities, and a command console. For emergencies, a diesel generator. These phosphor lamps have survived to this day. Sometimes they ran on radioactive radium. Low radiation, but still dangerous. But here, this is phosphorus. We check that to minimize the danger. Tornika found out that an important railroad line was monitored from here. They could turn on the sirens from here, maybe not all over the city, but at least here in this district. This find shows how tense the situation was back then. This device measures radiation in the body. If you worked at Chernobyl, for example, you had it in a pocket by your heart. After work, you could check how much and what kind of radiation your body had absorbed. At the time, radiation was measured in the unit RAD. Quite an interesting device. I haven't seen one anywhere else. In case of a nuclear attack, there are precise instructions. This wall shows what to do in an emergency, how to put on a gas mask correctly, how to use medication, and a lot of other information on radiation symptoms, for instance. The bunker we're in now is very close to the subway line. It's below us. If we listen carefully, we can hear the trains. The subway line and the bunker were built at the same time. Construction work on the Tbilisi metro began in 1952. Tbilisi was the fourth city in the Soviet Union to get a metro after Moscow, St. Petersburg and Kiev, which also says a lot about Tbilisi's status within the Soviet Union at the time. This uh, kind of activity was top secret, even building uh, regular buildings around, it was also top secret. <laughs> the construction of the subway provided the perfect cover for work on the bunker. 
auch Pläne. There won't be any plans either because they were of course top secret. Maybe they are somewhere in Moscow and we don't have access to them. The bunkers in Tbilisi were built at strategically important sites. Railroad stations, large factories and the airport. Tornika has uncovered many of them. He regularly checks to make sure everything is in order. I must write a letter about these persons who just take these doors. I will write that uh, I am throwing up an anthem uh, and my organization just controlling these bankers, FE, and if they just take these harmful doors, they will have problems. <laughs> Each year, people gather at Stalin's birth house in Gori. Ziana has also come along to counteract the glorification of Stalin. It's May 9th, a day Russia still celebrates the victory over Nazi Germany. A small group of elderly Georgians has gathered, mourning the old days. Nazi Stefanishvili is one of them. He gave us a happy life. Everyone had work. Everything was much cheaper. Nazi admires Stalin, Jana loathes him, yet they're still friends. I usually don't argue with older people because I believe there is no point. Uh, the only point will be to insult them. But when it comes to young people, yes, I try more to tell them the information I have because it's the young people who create future of the country. To this day, there's still been no real review of the Stalinist era in Georgia. Jana goes with Nazi to her home. She often comes here on guided tours. Nazi has set up a private Stalin museum in a small room next to the living room. Over the years, she's collected a lot connected to the dictator. Beside it are photos of her family. This is my father. He's buried in Poland. He was 26 years old when he was sent to war. The war was almost over when he died, and he's buried in Krakow, Poland. I had just started walking when my father died. I was one and a half, maybe two years old. Not even that. If I had had a father, I would have had siblings. I wouldn't have been alone. He seems to have been a very good man. Very good. You maybe also love Stalin because he won the war against Germany? First of all, because he was from Gori. That's why I love him. Then I love him because he was Georgian. And then because he won the war. The war, but also its propaganda, still have an effect today. To this day, Georgia's history is tightly bound up with Russia. When Georgia launched an offensive to recapture South Ossetia in 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. The reason given was to help the ethnic minorities in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The war escalated. It was a shock living in independent Georgia, which was a dream for uh, uh, ages and for generations, and suddenly we are going back. The Russian army had nearly reached Tbilisi, then withdrew again following mediation by France. Russian troops, however, remained stationed in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. 
Russland hat dann nach dem 2008 After the 2008 war, Russia recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia as independent states. Russia didn't manage to achieve that recognition internationally. Only very few states followed their lead. But from at least the Russian legal point of view, they became independent states. That's why 20% of Georgian territory is now occupied by Russia, and Russian military bases are located 50 kilometers from Tbilisi. It is a still very big scar of uh, society, and we still remember this 15 uh, year ago, how everything happened. The mood in Georgia is clear. In March 2023, 73% of Georgians were in favor of joining NATO. And as many as 82% supported the country joining the EU. In March 2023, there were mass protests in Tbilisi against a planned law. Organizations and media that receive money from abroad were to be registered as foreign agents. You can also see from the protests how many people take to the streets when they feel that the EU integration process is at risk, because it has become part of their national identity. Georgians feel European and want to belong to Europe. Georgia's younger generation wants to deal with the past, make it visible. Tornika and his team delve into the world of the hidden bunkers to preserve them for future generations. The burden of the Soviet Union still weighs heavy on Georgia today. And I believe that without coming to terms with history, it will be difficult to make progress in the democratization of this country. The constant threat from Russia has shaped the people of Georgia. The fight for freedom of Georgia is a constant thing uh, throughout the whole of our history, and it's still going on. Success. The bunker door is repaired. Georgia, a country divided and living with a painful legacy, the traces of which have been left, to this day, largely undiscovered. Thank you.